for showing up. It's like almost after the convention. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, one thing I did for this convention was I had these books come out, and one of them was my old, not old, my first short story collection, In the Forest of Forgetting. And it's been put out in this beautiful new edition by Papa Mary Press. And I'm so proud of this because, yes, I'm responsible for the words, and hopefully the words are OK. But the publisher just did such a beautiful job putting this book together. And the um, illustrator is a woman named Virginia Lee, who's the daughter of Alan Lee, who was a consultant on the, he's a big, famous artist, um, illustrated a lot of Tolkien, and was a consultant on the movies. Um, and this is his daughter, who's just as talented, and I hope people know about her too, because she's wonderful. And they're meant to work as a set. This is my new uh, poetry collection. So one thing that I did for this convention was bring um, one copy of each poem from the collection, and I've just been distributing them randomly. So if you did not get a poem, you feel like you want a poem, just hand this around, and I have a few left, so you can have one. Um, what I'm going to read today is a story that was published on Lightspeed Magazine. I'm only going to read you part of it, but I don't feel bad about that because it's online. So if you want to know how it ends, you, it, it went up last week. So as of right now, you can go and figure out how it ends. It's called Samaria from the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology. Um, and it's about the part of the world that I'm from. Um, I was born in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, so this is about, it's about Eastern Europe, um, and you'll get that from the story, um, but um, it, it um, the, there are things that have happened in that part of the world that happened since I wrote the story. So there are mentions of here in the Ukraine, and um, it, it's, it's sort of oblique, but it's, it, it takes place in the Crimea, basically. Um, and all the stuff that has happened in the Crimea happened after I wrote the story, which has been really weird. Um, but you'll get that. I will uh, go ahead and start. Samaria, from the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology. Remembering Samaria. I walk through the bazaar, between the stalls of the spice sellers, smelling turmeric and cloves, Hearing the clash of bronze from the cellars of cooking pots, the bleed of goats from the butcher's alley. Rugs hang from wooden racks, scarlet and indigo. In the quarters of the alleys, men without legs perch on wooden carts, telling their stories to a crowd of ragged children, making coins disappear into the air. Women from the mountains, their faces prematurely old from sun and suffering, call to me in a dialect I can barely understand. Their stands sell eggplants and tomatoes, the pungent olives that are distinctive to Sumerian cuisine, video games. In the mountain villages, it has long been accustomed to dye hair blue for good fortune, a practice that sophisticated urbanites have lately adopted. Even the women at court have hair of a deep and startling hue. My guide, Afa, walks ahead of me with a string bag in her hand, examining the vegetables, buying the cauliflowers and lentils. Later, she will make rice mixed with raisins, meat, and saffron. The cuisine of Samaria is rich, heavy with goat and chicken. They eat and keep no pigs. The pastries are filled with almond paste and soaked in honey. She waddles ahead of me. Forgive me, but you do waddle, Afa. Uh, and I follow amid a cacophony of voices, speaking the Indo-European language of Samaria, which is closest, perhaps, to Iranian. The mountain accents are harsh, the tones of the urbanites soft and lisping. Shayla spoke in those tones when she taught me phrases in her language. Can I have more lozi? A cake made with marzipan flavored with orange water. You are the son of a dog. I will love you until the ocean swallows the moon. A traditional saying, at the end of time, the serpent that lies beneath the black sea will rise up and swallow the moon as stone or lozi. It means, I will love you until the end of time. On that day, or perhaps it is another day I remember, I see a man selling Kalashnikovs. The war is a recent memory here, and every man has at least one weapon. Even I wear a curved knife in my belt, or I will be taken for a prostitute. Male prostitutes, who are common in the capital, can be distinguished by their coal rimmed eyes, their extravagant clothes, their weaponlessness. As a red-haired Irishman, I do not look like them. But 
it is best to avoid misunderstandings. The sun shines down from a cloudless sky. It is hotter than summer in Arizona, on the campus of a small college where this journey began, where we said, let us imagine a modern scenario. What would it look like? I know now. The city is cooled by a thousand fountains, we are told. Its name means just that, a thousand fountains. It was founded in the 6th century BCE, or so we have conjectured and imagined. I have a pounding headache. I have been two weeks in this country, and I cannot get used to the heat, the smells, the reality of it all. Could we have created this? The four of us, me and Lisa and Michael II and Professor Farrow, sitting in a conference room at that small college? Surely not. And yet, we were worried that the Khan would forbid us from entering the country. But no, we were issued visas, assigned translators, given office space in the palace itself. The Khan was a short man, balding. His wife had been Miss Samaria, and then a television reporter for one of the three state channels. She had met the Khan when she had been sent to interview him. He wore a business suit with a traditional scarf around his neck. She looked as though she had stepped out of a photo shoot for Vogue Russia, which was available in all the gas stations. Samaria has been here, on the shores of the Black Sea, for more than 2,000 years, he said. Would you like some coffee, Dr. Nolan? I think our coffee is the best in the world. It was. Dark, thick, spiced, and served with used milk. This theory of yours, that a group of American graduate students created Samaria in their heads, merely by thinking about it, you will understand that some of our people find it insulting. They <laughs> will say that all Americans are imperialist dogs. I myself find it amusing, almost charming, like poetry. The mind creates reality, yes. So our poets have taught us. Of course, your version is culturally insensitive, but then you are Americans. I did not think Americans were capable of poetry. Only Lisa had been a graduate student, and even she had recently graduated. Mike and I were postdocs, and Professor Farrow was tenured at Southern Arizona State. It all seemed so far away. The small campus with its perpetually dying lawns and drab 1970s architecture. I was standing in a reception room, drinking coffee with a con of Samaria and his wife, and Arizona seemed imaginary, like something I had made up. But we like Americans here. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, is he not? Any enemy of Russia is a friend of mine. So I am glad to welcome you to my country. You will, I am certain, be sensitive to our customs. Your co-worker, for example. I suggest that she not wear short pants in the streets. Our clerics, whether Orthodox, Catholic, or Muslim, are traditional and may be offended. Anyway, you must admit, such garments are not attractive on women. I would not say so to her, you understand, for women are the devil women. But a woman should cultivate an air of mystery. There is nothing mysterious about bare red knees. Our office space was in an unused part of the palace. My translator, Jaffik, told me it had once been a storage area for bedding. It was close to the servants' quarters. The Khan may have welcomed us to Samaria for diplomatic reasons, but he did not think much of us. That was clear. It was part of the old palace, which had been built in the 13th century CE after the final defeat of the Mongols. Since then, Samaria had been embroiled in almost constant warfare, with Anatolia, Scythia, Poland, and most recently the Russians, who had wanted its ports on the Black Sea. The Khan had received considerable American aid, including military advisors. The war had ended with the disintegration of the USSR. The Ukraine, focused on its own economic problems, had no wish to interfere in local politics, so Samaria was enjoying a period of relative peace. I wondered how long it would last. Lisa was our linguist. She would stay in the capital for the first three months, then venture out into the countryside recording local dialects. You know what amazes me, she said, as we were unpacking our computers and office supplies? The complexity of all this. You would think it really had been here for the last
last 3,000 years. It's hard to believe it all started with Mike the First goofing off in Professor Farrow's class. He had been bored. And instead of taking notes, had started sketching a city. The professor had caught him and had told the students that we would spend the rest of the semester creating that city and the surrounding countryside. We would be responsible for its history, customs, language. Lisa was in the class too and I was the TA. AM 703, contemporary anthropological theory, had turned into creating Samaria. Of the four graduate students in the course, only Lisa stayed in the program. One got married and moved to Wisconsin, another transferred to the School of Education so she could become a kindergarten teacher. Mike the first left with his master's and went on to do an MBA. It was a coincidence that Professor Farrell's next postdoc, who arrived in the middle of the semester, was also called Mike. He had an undergraduate degree in classics and was the one who decided that the country we were developing was Samaria. He was also particularly interested in the Borges hypothesis. Everyone had been talking about it at Michigan where he had done his PhD. At that point, it was more controversial than it is now, and Professor Farrow had only been planning to touch on it briefly at the end of the semester. But once we started on Samaria, AN703 became an experiment in creating reality through perception and expectation. Could we actually create Samaria by thinking about it, writing about it? Well, not in one semester, of course. After the semester ended, all of us worked on the Samaria project. It became the topic of Lisa's dissertation, a dictionary and grammar of modern Samaria with commentary. Mike focused on history. I wrote articles on culture, figuring out probable rites of passage, how the Samarians would bury their dead. We had Herodotus, we had accounts of cultures from that era. We were all steeped in anthropological theory. On weekends, when we should have been going on dates, we gathered in a conference room under a fluorescent light and talked about Samaria. It was fortunate that around that time, the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology was founded at Penn State. Otherwise, I don't know where we would have published. <laughs> at the first Imaginary Anthropology Conference in Orlando, we realized that a group from Tennessee was working on a modern republic of Scythia and Sarmatia, which shared a border with Samaria. We formed a working group. <laughs> don't let the Samarians hear you talking about creating this, I said, especially the nationalists. Remember, they have guns, and you don't. Should I mention her cargo shorts? I had to admit, looking at her knobby red knees above socks and Birkenstocks, that the con had a point. Before she left for the mountains, I would warn her to wear more traditional clothes. I was going to stay in the capital. My work would focus on the ways in which the historical practices we had described in Samaria, a proposal, in the second issue of the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology, influenced and remained evident in modern practice. Already I had seen developments we had never anticipated. One was the fashion for blue hair. In a footnote, Mike had written that blue was a fortunate color in Sumerian folk belief. Another was the ubiquity of cats in the capital. In an article on funerary rites, I had described how cats were seen as guides to the land of the dead until the coming of Christianity in the 12th century CE. The belief should have gone away, but somehow it had persisted in every household, whether Orthodox, Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, or one of the minor sects that flourished in the relative tolerance of Samaria had its cat. No Samarian wanted his soul to get lost on the way to paradise. Stray cats were fed at the public expense, and no one dared harm a cat. I saw them everywhere when I ventured into the city. In a month, Mike was going to join us, and I would be able to show him all the developments I was documenting. Meanwhile, there was email and Skype. I was assigned a bedroom and bath close to our offices. Afa, who had been a, a sort of undercook, was assigned to be my servant, but quickly became my guide, showing me around the city and mocking my Sumerian accent. <laughs> she would say, no, Dr. Pat, that word is not pronounced that way. Do not repeat it that way, I beg of you. I am an old woman, but still it is not respectable for me to hear. Jaffik was my language teacher as well as my translator, teaching me the language Lisa had created based on what we knew of historical Sumerian and its Indo-European roots, except that it had developed an extensive vocabulary. As used by modern Sumerians, it had the nuance and fluidity of a living language as well as a surprising number of expletives. 
<laughs> I had no duties except to conduct my research, which was a relief from the grind of TA and recently teaching my own undergraduate classes. But one day, I was summoned to speak with a con. It was the day of an official audience, so he was dressed in Sumerian ceremonial robes, although he still wore his Rolex watch. His advisors looked impatient, and I gathered that the audience was about to begin. I had seen a long line of supplicants waiting by the door as I was ushered in. But he said, as though we had all the time in the world, Dr. Nolan, did you know that my daughters are learning American? Sitting next to him were four girls, all wearing the traditional headscarves worn by Sumerian peasant women, but pulled back to show that their hair was not fashionably blue. They are very troublesome, my daughters. They like everything modern, Leonardo DiCaprio, video games. Tradition is not good enough for they wish to attend university and find professions or do humanitarian work. Ah, oh, what is a father to do? He shook a finger at them, fondly enough. I would like it if you could teach them the latest American idioms. The slang, as it were. That afternoon, Afa led me to another part of the palace, the royal family's personal quarters. These were more modern and considerably more comfortable than ours. I was shown into what seemed to be a common room for the girls. There were colorful rugs and divans, embroidered wall hangings, and an enormous flat screen TV. These are the Khan's daughters, said Afa. She had already explained to me, in case I made any blunders, that they were his daughters by his first wife, who had not been Miss Samaria, but had produced the royal children, a son and then only daughters, and, a, and then a second son who had died shortly after birth. She had died a week later of an infection contracted during the difficult delivery. Anor is the youngest, then Tala, and then Shayla, who was already taking university classes online. Shayla smiled at me. This time, none of them were wearing headscarves. There really was something attractive about blue hair. And, and what about the fourth one? She was sitting a bit back from the others, to the right of and behind Shayla, whom she closely resembled. Afa looked at me with astonishment. The Khan has three daughters, she said. Anur, Tala, and Shayla. There is no fourth one, Dr. Pat. The fourth one stared at me without expression. Sumerians don't recognize twins, said Lisa. That has to be the explanation. Do you remember the 13th century philosopher Farkash Kursand? When God made the world, he decreed that human beings would be born one at a time unique. Unlike animals, they would be born defenseless without claws or teeth or fur, but they would have souls. It's, it's in a children's book. I have a copy somewhere, but it's based on Persan's reading of Genesis and one of his philosophical treatises. My would know which. And it's the basis of Sumerian human rights law, actually. That's why women have always had more rights here. They have souls, so they've been allowed to vote since Sumeria became a parliamentary monarchy. I'm sure it's mentioned in all of the articles. I don't remember which one, but check the database Mikey's putting together. Shayla must have been a twin. And the Sumerians don't recognize the second child as separate from the first. So Shayla is one girl in two bodies, but with one soul. Who came up with that stupid idea? <laughs> well, to be perfectly honest, it might have been you. She leaned back in her revolving chair. I don't know how she could do that without falling. Or Mike, of course. It certainly wasn't my idea. Embryologically, it does make a certain sense. Identical twins really do come from one egg. So, they're both shale. There is no both. The idea of both is culturally inappropriate. There is one shale in two bodies. Think of them as shale and her shadow. I tested this theory once while walking through the market with Afa. We were walking through the alley of the doll sellers. In Samaria, almost every house has a dog for defense or to catch rats. Cats are not sold in the market. They cannot be sold at all, only given or will away. To sell a cat for money is to imperil your moral soul. We passed a woman sitting on the ground with a basket beside her. In it were two infants, as alike as the proverbial two peas in a pot, half covered with a ragged blanket. Beside them lay a dirty mop with a chain around its neck that lifted its head and whimpered as we walked by. Child, how many in basket? I asked Afa in my still imperfect scenario. There is one child in that basket, Patty, she said. 
I could not get her to stop using the, the diminutive. I even told her that in my language, Patty was a woman's name, to no effect. She just smiled, patted me on the arm, and assured me that no one would mistake such a tall, handsome, which in Sumerian is the same word as beautiful, man for a woman. Only one child? Of course, one basket, one child. Shayla's shadow followed her everywhere. When she and her sisters sat with me in a room with the low divans and the large screen TV studying American slang, she was there. What's up? Shayla would say, laughing, and her shadow would stare down at the floor. When Shayla and I walked through the gardens, she walked six paces behind, pausing when we paused, sitting when we sat. After we were married in our apartment in Arizona, she would sit in a corner of the bedroom, watching as we made love. Although I always turned off the lights, I could see her, a darkness against the off-white walls of faculty housing. Once I tried to ask Shayla about her. Shayla, do you know the word twin? Yes, of course, she said. In America, if two babies are born at the same time, they are twins. What about in Samaria? Surely there is a Sumerian word for twin. Sometimes two babies are born at the same time in Samaria, too. She looked confused. I suppose so. Biology is the same everywhere. Well, what's the word, then? I cannot think of it. I shall have to email Tala. She is better at languages than I am. What if you yourself were a twin? Me. But I am not a twin. If I were, my mother would have told me. I tried a different tactic. Do you remember the dog you had, Tala? She had two sisters, born at the same time. Those were Anora's and Tala's dogs. They were not Tala, even though they were born in the same litter. You could think of them as twins, I mean triplets. I remember them gambling together, Kala and her two litter mates. They would follow us through the gardens, and Shayla and her sisters would pet them indiscriminately. When we sat under the plum trees, they would tumble together into one doggy heap. Pat, what is this all about? Is this about the fact that I don't want to have a baby right now? You know I want to go to graduate school first. I did not think her father would approve the marriage. I told her so. Your father will never agree. Do you marry a poor American postdoc? Do you have any idea how poor I am? My research grant is all I have. You do not understand Sumerian politics, Shayla replied. Do you know what percentage of our population is ethnically Sarmatian? 20%, all in the eastern province. They fought the Russians, and they still have weapons. Not just guns, tanks, anti-aircraft missiles. The Sarmatians are getting restless, Patty. They are mostly Catholic in a country that is mostly Orthodox. They want to unite with their homeland, create a greater Scythia and Sarmatia. My father projects an image of strength because what else can you do? But he is afraid. He is most afraid that the Americans will not help. They helped against the Russians, but this is an internal matter. He has talked to us already about different ways for us to leave the country. Anur has been enrolled at the Lycée International in Paris. And Tala is going to study at the American School in London. They can get student visas. For me, it is more difficult. I must be admitted at a university. That is why I have been taking online courses. Ask him. If he says no, then no. But I think he will consider my marriage with an American. She was right. The Khan considered. For a week, and then another, while pro starvation factions clashed with military in the eastern province, then protests broke out in the capital. Anora was already in Paris with her mother, supposedly on a shopping spree for school. Tala had started school in London. In the Khan's personal office, I signed the marriage contract, barely understanding what I was signing because it was in an ornate script I had seen only in medieval documents. On the way to the airport, we stopped by the cathedral in Shahin Square, where we were married by the patriarch of the Sumerian Independent Orthodox Church who checked the faxed copy of my baptismal certificate and lectured me in sonorous tones about the importance of conversion, raising children in the true faith. The Khan kissed Shayla on both cheeks, promising her that we would have a proper ceremony when the political situation was more stable and she could return to the country. In the Khan's private plane, we flew to a small airport near Fresno and spent our first night together at my mother's house. My dad had died of a heart attack while I was in college, and she lived alone in the house where I had grown up. 
It was strange staying in the guest bedroom, down the hall from the room where I had slept as a child, which, which still had my He-Man action figures on the shelves, the skeletal to face with permanent marker. I had to explain to her about Shayla's shadow. I don't understand, my mother said. Are you all going to live together? Well, yes, I guess so. It's really no different than if her twin sister were living with us, is it? And, and Shayla is going to take undergraduate classes? What is her sister going to do? I have no idea, I said. What she did more than anything else was watch television. All day it would be on. Mostly she watched CNN and the news shows. Sometimes I would test Shayla, say, did you turn the TV on? Is it on? She would say. Then of course I must have turned it on, unless you left it on before you went out. How did your class go? Is that football player in the back still falling asleep? One day I came home and noticed that the other Shayla was cooking dinner. Later I asked, Shayla, did you cook dinner? Of course, I said, she said. Did you like it? Yes. It was actually pretty good, chicken and a thick red stew over rice. It reminded me of a dish Afa had made in an iron pot hanging over an open fire in the servants' quarters. But I guess it could be made on an American stovetop as well. After that, the other Shayla cooked dinner every night. It was convenient because I was teaching night classes, trying to make extra money. Shayla told me that I did not need to work so hard that her, the money her father gave her was more than enough to support us both. But I was proud and didn't want to live off my father-in-law even if he was the con of Samaria. At the same time, I was trying to write up my research on Samarian funerary practices. If I could publish a paper in the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology, I might have a shot at a tenure track position, or at least a visiting professorship somewhere that wasn't Arizona. Shayla was trying to finish her med requirements. She had decided that she wanted to be a pediatrician. Meanwhile, in Samaria, the situation was growing more complicated. The pro-Sarmatian faction had split into the radical Sons of Sarmatia and the more moderate Sarmatian Democratic Alliance. Happening? It's three o'clock, so continue if you wish. It's too much to stop for. Few minutes. Although the Prime Minister claimed that the SDA was a front, there were weekly clashes with the police in the capital, and the Sons of Sarmatia had planted a bomb in the Hilton, although a maid had reported a suspicious shopping bag and the hotel had been evacuated before the bomb could go off. The Khan had imposed a curfew and martial law by the Nets, although the army had a significant Sarmatian minority. But I had classes to teach, so I tried not to pay attention to politics, and even Shayla dismissed it all as a mess. One day, I came home from a departmental meeting, and Shayla wasn't in the apartment. She was usually home by seven. I assumed she'd have to stay late for a lab. The other Shayla was cooking dinner in the kitchen. At eight, when she hadn't come back yet, I sat down at the kitchen table to eat. To my surprise, the other Shayla sat down across from me, and the place sat for Shayla. She had never sat down at the table with us before. She looked at me with her dark eyes and said, How was your day, Patty? I dropped my fork. It clattered against the rim of the plate. She had never spoken before, not one sentence, not one word. Her voice was just like Shayla's, but with a stronger accent. At least, it sounded stronger to me, or, or maybe not. It was hard to tell. Where's Shayla? I said. I could feel a constriction in my chest, as though a fist had started to close around my heart, like the beginning of my father's heart attack. I think, even then, I knew. What do you mean? She said. I'm Shayla. I have always been Shayla. The only Shayla there is. I stared down at the land and peas and saffron curry. The smell reminded me of Samaria of the bazaar. I could almost hear the clash of the cooking pots. And I'll end there. Uh -huh. If you want to go to the it's online.